We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello everybody, uh, good afternoon and welcome to our session. Uh, our session is a uh, youth discussion on AI, uh, on misuse of AI and IoT technologies. Well, I guess the title speaks for itself. Our objective here is to uh, have a discussion on how cybersecurity is concerned in the debates regarding artificial intelligence and Internet of Things. Uh, our objective is to uh, understand what our international standards that could apply to IoT and AI, what are good practices that uh, could be developed and what are the current challenges that we still face uh, in this field. Uh, we have chosen to have a special youth perspective on the issue because we understand that young people are often an underrepresented group in the debates about uh, artificial intelligence and the internet of things. Even though uh, we are active users of those technologies, uh, perhaps the biggest group of users of uh, such uh, technology. So uh, our idea here is to have uh, a discussion with a specific focus on use, but that doesn't mean that you have to be young to be part of this panel. Uh, this is uh, an open discussion in which everybody's opinion is very open. Uh, so we have four panelists today. One of them is gonna be online, uh, but we have three of them here with us today. So um, I'll briefly introduce them. So we have uh, Savio Moraes uh, directly from Brazil. He's a vice chair of uh, the DC I3POS working group on IoT security by design, has a master's degree in computer science. He's a professor of the Federal Institute of Rio Grande do Norte in Brazil. And his work focuses on supporting the deployment of existing cybersecurity standards and best practices for IoT, as well as identify and bridging those gaps. Uh, we have Nicolas Fiomarelli directly from Uruguay. He's also a computer engineer, graduated from the University of uh, the Republic of Uruguay, currently studying computer science also at the same institution. Uh, Nicolas is part of ISOC Uruguay chapter, and he's a co-founder of the Youth IGF Uruguay Initiative. Uh, he's also an activist on several topics, including emerging technologies, such as quantum communication and IoT. We also have Ahita Gangaravapu from India. He's a she's a research scholar at the IIT Hyderabad, India, working on Internet of Things, security and smart cities. Uh, she's also part of ICT standardization bodies and also a member of the ITU uh, Generation Connect Visionaries Board and a funding member of Youth IGF India. And we have Orabili Amundongo here close to me. He's an AI policy extern and recipient in the Center of AI and Digital Policy. He has previously worked as a policy researcher with ICT Africa and currently pursuing a master's degree in automated facial recognition system and algorithm governance. Uh, so just to briefly explain the dynamics our, of our session today, uh, we're first gonna have uh, a round conversation within our panelists today. So each one, one of them is gonna speak for 10 minutes on AI and IoT. Uh, so we're first starting with AI and then moving on to IoT. And after that, we're gonna have an open discussion uh, with all the participants. Uh, using a platform called Mentimeter. I don't know if you're familiar with that platform. Uh, we're gonna project some questions here in the, in the screen and you're very much invited to interact with us on that. Uh, so I'm passing now the word to Billy Mudongo who's, who will be speaking about AI first. Yeah, I mean, thank you so much for, for the opportunity and to be part of uh, this dialogue. I'm really here to just get to learn from everyone and, you know, get to understand um, how we can address this kind of issues together. Um, you know, as my colleague has already mentioned, I've been working um, around issues related to artificial intelligence for quite some time, um, you know, including the project around AI and um, AI surveillance in Africa, as well as how 
uh, the implications of AI, particularly affecting you know African societies around um, you know intersections around digital inequality, and how uh, we can address those impl implications. But coming back to the you know the the topic for today, um, you know I, I want to believe that you know this session really opens up a dialogue where we are able to discuss um, you know emerging and cross-cutting issues around trust, security, and you know, the stability of AI technologies. And I think um, it really opens um, the need for us to start really thinking about assessing and addressing the, you know, the serious risks that this technology poses to uh, human rights, privacy, and also you know, the potential implications around um, how they perpetuate uh, digital divide, particularly from a uh, global South perspective. But I think about, you know, AI in the context of, you know, technology that promotes uh, public good in the public service, where uh, technology modernizes processes, where, um, you know, where policies also speak to uh, issues in a meaningful way uh, to benefit how society operates. Uh, in addition to that, I kind of really see AI evolve um, in a way that magnifies our ability and how society's ability to use, um, you know, personal information in ways that can really uh, intrude um, personal privacy interests uh, by raising, um, you know, the analysis of personal information to new levels of power and speed. And such an example of this is basically how uh, facial recognition systems offer this kind of preview of the privacy issues that we are, we are really trying to grapple with today. Um, for example, we've been seeing different states across Africa adopting AI-driven surveillance technologies. Um, and most of their, you know, benefits and purposes for those technologies are kind of really skewed. You can't really differentiate what's legal and um, what's illegal there. Um, you know, I, I, I really wanted to think of this topic as more or less, you know, where AI technology is really uh, transforming the areas of our society and how it opens uh, these new avenues. Um, and it, I think it has also shown us this fresh possibilities um, of simplifying our lives in the society, but more importantly, how this technology can also uh, deepen, you know, this existing inequalities, particularly those that have access to uh, technologies and those that don't have. But more importantly, I think uh, speaking uh, in the context of how this technology affects the society, we need to start thinking about addressing these issues that we within the community where uh, young people are involved in this, you know, policy dialogue, where they are given a space at the table to start contributing towards policy development processes uh, that speaks to artificial intelligence. But then uh, giving a little bit of a background issue to how we got, we've gotten to really start talking about the nitty gritties of how AI uh, you know, perpetuates digital inequality or possibly perpetuate digital inequality and some of the possible you know, implications in the society. I think you know, so far the developments in AI have been predominantly been driven more by private sector. Um, and, you know, of course there is, or there has been some, um, some growing interest by, you know, different governments uh, to start, which has actually really, which is opening up new conversations to, to really start, you know, thinking about how can we develop um, AI strategies that speaks to the needs that we see in our societies. And um, I think these strategies will subsequently, you know, help improve and grow um, governance processes in our governments as well. Uh, but while the above 
um, you know, such kind of developments are really can be seen as positive uh, steps towards addressing these issues. I think we need to uh, also need to, you know, address the gaps that we see also in our societies in terms of the power of how the power of AI uh, to augment skills and also, you know, the resource deficit that we have been um, witnessing and seeing also, particularly in developing countries where we have these technologies being uh, developed and changing how society operates, but at the same time, having this kind of imbalance uh, between uh, those that don't have the proper skills to really meet the standards of the industry. But in the context of you know, COVID-19 pandemic also, uh, we have been seeing you know, various uh, developments being established by a number of governments where um, as a way or a measure to contain the spread of the virus, including um, the launch of digital uh, contact tracing technologies. But towards these technologies, we also note um, the overlying aspect of big data um, where these platforms are basically, you know, gathering data from users, possibly having the implications of, you know, datafication and, you know, this overlying digitalization we are seeing in the society. And what's really um, scary about these developments is the, actually the, the, the current data privacy legislation uh, landscape we are seeing also in developing countries where there isn't really much um, work being done to develop you know um, effective data privacy frameworks to protect user privacy and issues like that but in terms of uh, really you know thinking about the key challenges here that we are seeing within the AI realm is perhaps, you know, issues around monopoly and centralization of, you know, big monopoly, I mean, big powers within a private sector and big technology companies where only a handful of tech giants have access to resources and they're able to build AI technologies that are data intens intensive and they're not really uh, being accountable to anyone. And the second challenge I think um, we've been seeing in the industry is maybe around issues of data privacy, which I've already alluded to, and AI governance. We lack, you know, proper frameworks to regulate the use of AI technologies, which um, has might have, you know, long-term implications around bias and discrimination, which of course we have already, you know, witnessed such kind of incidents. Uh, the other thing I think um, we need to look at here is perhaps, you know, addressing issues of industry norms where really big companies that are developing AI technologies and those that are actually, you know, adopting them in the society, um, they kind of really, we need standards that embed the systems to, we need the systems to be embedded in societal values and norms where they respect, you know, privacy issues there and perhaps you know uh, standards like uh, around accountability and transparency as well but in terms of really you know interesting developments that also we have been seeing in terms of uh, how these challenges are emerging uh, in Africa particularly you know there has been some emerging regional initiatives supporting you know strong data governance policies that enable you know data innovation uh, for example, as recommended from the, you know, the African Union uh, digital transformation strategy to support Africa's vision for growth in the digital era. And what's really interesting about such kind of strategies is that, you know, some of these advancements um, might likely to, they, they're likely to shift the dynamics of data and power and how, you know, industry operates and how governments operate or adopt these technologies. So in terms of um, really approach, I think I'll touch that, touch base that um, I can give it to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Horabeli. Uh, from your speech, I thought uh, 
what you mentioned about digital skills gap is a really important aspect that sometimes is neglected in the discussions about AI and IoT, because when we're talking about cybersecurity, you're usually focusing on, on the corporate side and the technical side, and we forget about the user. And when we're talking about a use perspective on IoT and AI, it's really important to, to discuss that as well, because uh, in, in a lot of cases, the, the young person is the end user, and that person does not necessarily have the skill to, to protect his or herself online. Uh, so that's also a very important point that you touched upon. Uh, well, I'm passing now the word to Nicolas Fiumarelli, who's also talking about AI. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Juliana. Well, I, I will go deep in a little more so you to understand what are the youth concerns uh, about artificial intelligence. Because as you know, youth are a very active uh, internet user. We know that 70% of the uh, population using internet is, is a youth. And well, they, they have the, their worries because sometimes they are activists. So what, what, what has AI that, that is like a, this biased thing of AI that you identify, right? So I, I will start uh, discussing a little or, or defining what is artificial intelligence so you can have a, a sense of the different approaches and, and different things. For example, AI can be described as the technique that enables a computer or a computational systems to mimic any type of, of intelligence, right? But what, what is, is intelligence, right? Is that the machine is capable of solving specific problems like the humans, but well, today only very well-defined problems can be solved by these artificial intelligence systems. So, but most of the people talked about artificial intelligence, but there is another concept that is a machine learning, right? Well, the machine learning is a particular type of artificial intelligence that refers to algorithms and techniques that learn by themselves confronted with this data, right? So what Abilia talked about this big data concept and all these observations and interactions that the machine has with the surrounding world are that that, that would be able to, to construct these specific representations of the reality to, to give some uh, things to the environment, right? So this, these specific characteristics enable us to use computers for new tasks that we never uh, or will be like impossible to code manually. So what, what happened? There are different application areas or, of the artificial intelligence. We have heard about the speech recognition, for example, or the personalization of uh, websites based on user interests. So email filtering, applicant screening, this clinical diagnosis. So a lot of things that has risks, but at the same time has some bias things. So uh, we will talk a little more about this because there is a full process that the artificial intelligence use that is a collection of this data, right? Uh, by people, surveys, pictures, maybe comments on chats. So the, these chat bots learn a lot from, from the users and try to, to pre-process data or try to, to figure it out some patterns so they can respond or, or at least have some uh, representation of the reality and try to, to, to do the thinking of a human in terms of responding to, to that, right? So there are like, this pre-processing data. So the training of the machine learning is based on, on, on a lot of data, like the big data. But this, this model, the model that, that used the, the machine learning or the artificial intelligence inside is like a black box, right? The, sometimes it's, it is very difficult to explain what the algorithm has decided or, or how the algorithm decides something. And this is terrible because, uh, for example, there is a, a thing that, that is very, uh, it's, it's a full conversation uh, now that is a little autonomous waypoint systems at uh, some frontiers that use facial recognition. And what happened if this uh, uh, machine uh, shoot uh, to people? Uh, there are several things that are very like ethical things, right? That we need to, to really uh, start to talk. It's like the nuclear weapons. If we don't talk about that or know who has the power of these technologies, uh, we will be behind. So it's not a matter of controlling these technologies, in, uh, but uh, to know uh, where, where is this power. So we need, we need to control this. Uh, well, uh, and there are some challenges, right? Because this data collection could, could be based on incorrect or biased collection of things from data documentation. Uh, it is very known that, for example, chatbots uh, began uh, to be like racists uh, because the, the, it's, it's all based on the data that, that they collect. So, for example, another example is the, the yes, the facial recognition 
it is known that uh, for the, the, the color skin is very important because it's a, a need an inherent part of the of the mathematical inside of the facial recognition, for example. The, um, one consequence is that 30% uh, of, of black people is mismatched with other ones. So maybe if you go to, to a stadium or something, you want to enter in a soccer game, and they identify you as a, as a bad person, <laughs> but you are not that person. It's other one, but the algorithm confused. Like this 30% is very bad and is, is so there is a disadvantaged group <laughs> there. So same happened with the chatbots. Uh, sometimes, for example, the interpretation uh, could be uh, some uh, different uh, interpretation. For example, it is known that for women and for men, there are several phrases used in, in comments in Facebook or it, when the algorithm used this big data, for example, is is more common that that say like yeah she she need to take care of the kid or the oh the he he is the the strongest one. So these these comments these these things that the algorithm the process all the time uh, could have uh, an underrepresentation and it descends with a with a bias thing, right? So machine learning models uh, can become very complex and artificial intelligence decisions are hard to understand. So the lack of this transparency, as what Abiri was mentioning, uh, may lead to a lack of uh, accountability and liability. So the other problem is the explainability, right? If you, if, if uh, an autonomous vehicle take a decision, for example, if you have a, uh, 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 and uh, you will have an accident because of the speed is calculated and you, you don't have chance to, to avoid this situation of an accident. So the car recognizes this situation and they need to, to do some decisions, right? Maybe turning to the left or turning to the right. Imagine the situation that it, it's not possible to avoid the accident. So uh, you will turn to the left or to the right. Maybe at the left are three people, but at the right is one people. But what happened is, the, I don't know, Donald Trump is on the right. <laughs> so you will uh, kill, sorry for the word, uh, like the three people. So these things need to be decided and, and someone need to explain what was the decision of the algorithm. So the AI explainability is something that we need to, to be taken in mind because we'll be like the future of these <laughs> things. So that is uh, enough, I think, for, for introducing like some examples or, or some concepts or, 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 or of this. AI misuse, or at least these uh, these bias things that could happen with with artificial intelligence. Thank you very much, Nico. I think you tackled very important issues regarding user privacy uh, and the biases that can come from the misuse of uh, machine learning techniques. Uh, well, uh, we're passing the word now to Ahita. Uh, yeah, I see her in the screen. Uh, yeah, she's going to be talking about IoT. Yes. Thanks a lot, Juliana. So um, before I talk to you guys about IoT, I would actually want to, you know, link up IoT and artificial intelligence and then move on to understanding as to um, why security of Internet of Things is important and what are the challenges as to why is it so difficult to um, secure them, right? So um, before uh, we start off, let's think of a scenario. Let's, let's think of the human body, right? We have senses, we have sound, we sense sound, light, touch, smell, and all of these senses, uh, you know, that we have, and then all the sensed data is sent throughout the body through a network of nerves. And uh, in the nerves, in the brain, in the nerves, right? Um, the nerves in the brain, they process this data and based on whatever action is taken, like for example, you have a movement of a muscle. So that is your actuation. So this um, combination of the sense data to a processing of the sense data to get some insights after which taking an action or the actuation is a combination of IoT and AI, uh, which becomes the complete system. So um, that, is, I would, that is how I would want to explain how IoT and AI is linked. And that's the reason why we have incorporated both these topics in today's session. Um, now let's think of a, a situation where you have a thermostat and a manual thermostat. So basically if it gets hot in the room, you have to manually go and adjust the temperature based on your comfort. Now, if you were to um, introduce sensors, right? If you were to convert into an internet of things or IoT device, you will introduce a bunch of sensors. Like you'll have a temperature sensor, you'll have a humidity sensor, you, you'll have a carbon dioxide center, sensor. So all these uh, sensors will collect the sense data and accordingly uh, make you know changes. Like for example, reduce the um, um, temperature if it's getting too hot in the room. Uh, further, you know, machine learning can be used on this um, data 
uh, if like, for example, if you have a threshold on the carbon dioxide level, the level of CO2 in a room can determine uh, the occupancy of the room. And that could be something that ML can do. These kind of insights and predictions is where machine learning and artificial intelligence can come into play. Um, so we are seeing, of course, an exponential increase in the manufacturing, the deployment, and also the usage of IoT systems. And with IoT, we are uh, entering this realm of cyber-physical systems. And what cyber-physical systems are, basically inter integration of computation, uh, networking, and physical processes. So basically any changes that are made uh, are made in the physical world. Um, so if I were to, to give you another example of this, right? If you are looking at a swimming pool and in the swimming pool, there is um, an actuator that works or uh, an actuation happens uh, the actuation here is the opening or closing of the walls. So based on the chlorine level, um, the actuation happens. Um, let, let us say that this entire system gets affected like through a malware or any kind of cyber attack. Then um, even if the chlorine level in the water, you know, so the wall might not act properly and then it's going to release a lot of chlorine. So it can affect the person's health and also can lead to danger or, or loss of life. Another example, like uh, my colleagues just mentioned, was uh, an autonomous car, driverless car. So the sensors, you know, they are used to detect the obstacle. In our case, could be a human being. And if the system is compromised, the car will hit the person, right? So when you're looking at IoT systems, it is really important that um, to secure these, especially because IoT systems are very, um, you know, intertwined with their lives now at the rate at which they are increasing and being deployed. So when we're looking at the threats in general of IoT, you're looking at um, two different dimensions. Uh, one would be the device itself gets compromised um, because of, let's say, having a weak password, for example, or gets uh, um, malware through the software update. The other is other vector that we have is when the um, IoT device becomes a threat vector. So it is used to launch other And uh, most of your IoT devices, like baby monitors, cameras, were um, in, you know were attacked because of weak passwords, and they were used as um, threat um, attack vectors to attack the DNS um, server DIN uh, through a denial of service attack. So multiple requests were sent till all the resources were deplete, depleted of DNI, and it could not respond. So it's a distributed denial of service attack that was performed, um, and. Um, so these are just some examples that can, you know, can have very detrimental effects on our lives and our, on our societies. And that's, that's, that's why it's really important to secure IoT devices. Now, one might ask, why don't we just secure them? You know, because if security can save lives, can make it all easier, why don't we just secure it? IoT devices are also called resource constrained devices, as in they have constraint on the storage overhead in terms of processing. So um, this makes it difficult to do any kind of um, encryption. Let's say, for example, if your device is um, sensing temperature data and you would want to securely send it over the uh, wireless interface, then you will have to encrypt it. So the encryption has to happen on board the IoT device. So that will take up a bunch of you know, memory or storage. And that is a challenge with IoT device. And then the other challenge we have in terms of cost, you know, functionality versus cost. You would want to buy a low cost IoT device for the same function. So, and so lots of manufacturers use low cost sensors. So that is another issue or challenge. Then in terms of deployment scenario. So if you're talking about smart cities, you know, or if you're just talking about IoT devices deployed in remote areas, for example, to sense the moisture levels in an uh, agricultural field, then um, these are some uh, places where physical tampering of the device is also possible. And then you might not go every time to manage the device. So there's also, um, and the other issue is that once you're deploying in such remote places and just um, talking to other devices or your um, router or to uh, your cloud remotely, um, then there are chances of a man in the middle, or middle attack or somebody eavesdropping your uh, personal information or your data. Um, then the other challenge we have is the threat landscape. So when you're talking about IoT device, you know, we're talking in terms of the device itself, then you're talking in terms of the communication network, then you're talking um, and the data goes to the cloud. So your landscape is very distributed. So securing every interface becomes a challenge. 
And the last one, um, as per, uh, you know, from my understanding and my research is the fragmentation in the standards. So we don't have a consistency in the standards across the globe um, for uh, IoT security, as in terms of what are the requirements to secure IoT devices and um, how should it be done? What are the certification mechanisms? What are the labeling mechanisms? So there's a fragmentation. And this is a topic that we'll be picking up. I'll be picking up in a couple of minutes after in the second half of today's session. And this is where I believe that, you know, young people become an important stakeholder, as rightly pointed out by my friends, Nicholas and Juliana earlier. Um, so that it's important, like when we're designing st standards, you know, to have an open, transparent, and multi-stakeholder model, so that everybody's perspective, the manufacturers, the retailers, the consumers, everyone's perspective is on board. And this is where the young people's, um, young person uh, should also have a say into uh, as to how uh, the standards for security should be designed for IoT systems. Thanks. Great, thank you so much. Uh, now uh, we have our last speaker, Savio, who's also gonna be talking about IoT. Thank, thanks, Juliana. So good afternoon, uh, good evening, good morning, every, everywhere you are. Uh, uh, I, I'm talking, I'm gonna talk a bit about uh, one specific use case of IoT, that is the uh, home IoT scenario. Uh, uh, this was my, my, my research during, uh, it, this has been my research do, during the last three years. Uh, and we have some concerns in the scenario, in the ongoing and uh, the current uh, model of operation in, in the uh, home IoT devices uh, is that mostly, most part of the uh, uh, devices available in the market uh, have the, the cloud-based operations, which means that uh, even if I'm in my house and I want to switch off my smart bulb, I have to connect to the, the to the device's manufacturer, and it sends back the the request to the device. Uh, when I talk, when when I say this uh, in, in technical terms, it, it it's not that bad. But in in, in different words, uh, the manufacturer of your uh, smart bulb knows when you are sleeping, when you wake up, uh, when you are watching movies, so you uh, sh uh, set down your, your uh, light. Uh, so this is really complicated in the point of view of privacy and other, and other things. When we think, for example, in scenarios where uh, we can many and many other sensors uh, from the same manufacturer, for example, in, in, in one home uh, that, are, that has this type of, of operation uh, architecture based in the cloud. Uh, uh, so if you have, for example, moving sensors, uh, uh, switching lights, uh, your TV, your uh, music player, uh, and so on, uh, the, the manufacturer uh, itself can have uh, deep infer inferences about your routing and your uh, what you like to do. So more than this, uh, there is also one one problem in reliability. So please please imagine uh, that your uh, door locker uh, is connected to the internet and uses this type of communication. So you, your internet goes down and you cannot leave or get into your home. So this is also uh, a problem. And you can just you just can't rely in this type of device. Uh, and more more of the other things, not not considering uh, only the the uh, individual scenario, but uh, the collective scenario, for example. Uh, using also, for example, uh, the muse use of, of uh, artificial intelligence algorithms, uh, someone can uh, have inferences about the routing of one community 
about any other things, considering just even dropping uh, this data from the network flow. Uh, someone, for example, in AS, I, ISP that runs sometime uh, some sometime some type of algorithm that can have inferences uh, 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 in one type of services based in the request they those devices do to one the, the manufacturing website the service uh, the service provided by by the manufacturer so we have also these collective risks and order and orders so some devices also allow you to op operate them only in the home network, but this is the minor part actually. Uh, but even considering the, the, the ex exclusive uh, usage of, of this type of devices, uh, uh, this type of communication, sorry, in, in the local network, uh, we also have some problems, still have problems in, in developing uh, the standards for communicating, for configuration, and mostly for configuration because the, the end user uh, is not a, a expert in security uh, or even in uh, mostly they almost don't know how to connect the, the things to the Wi-Fi uh, and then start using. So the point why people are uh, having the preference for, for this type of uh, uh, operations, cloud-based operations, is that it, it makes easier the configuration of the device for both uh, operating the device from your home or from outside the home. Uh, and this is mostly be, uh, because of the usage of the network and the address translation uh, caused by the use of uh, IPv4 uh, that hinds uh, the device that are uh, behind the, the home home router, the, the home gateway. So it's hard to you for a end user or, or even for me, depending depending on uh, if the ISP use uh, uh, CGNAT. Uh, so this kind of things uh, also reinforces the use of this uh, cloud-based operations. But uh, coming back, to the point of, of uh, configurations. We also have some protocols that support this type of thing, but the problem is that they are also insecure. So we have, for example, a universal plug and play and the PCP that uh, supports this type of operation, the auto configuration uh, of devices, but uh, it have like 10 or five years that we know they are insecure. So we still don't have this kind of, of uh, protocols uh, for the devices or even for the users that are, are communicating, for example, or connecting and configuring like by a user interface, by a, a smartphone app, uh, there is also one problem. And moreover, uh, we also have uh, problems for, for example, if you have one uh, security surveillance camera uh, in your house and you have to access it by the, your browser, for example, you can't use, you still can't trust in the, in the HTTPS uh, uh, certificate because this kind of operations uh, in the you know, current browsers uh, asso associate the, the, the certificate that encrypt the whole communications uh, with a host name, a DNS name, and this kind of DNS name uh, has to be uh, public in the public DNS. You can't be have, uh, you can't have, for example, a mycamera.local uh, uh, domain name for your, your your camera and associate it to a uh, TLS certificate for for using uh, HTTPS. Uh, communication and then encrypted communication with your camera or, or with any other sensors. So uh, these are the main problems. Uh, we have some other things that we can that we can uh, talk more later. Uh, but this is a start, uh, starting point. So thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, just commenting briefly on what you said and also what Ahita said earlier. Uh, uh, I thought it was super interesting how you mentioned that one of the problems uh, with IoT security is, uh, well, manufacturers uh, using cloud uh, cloud services to make those services available. 
but sometimes the the companies that are employing this kind of devices they're not really concerned about what's behind the architecture of iot so they're only concerned about reducing the cost of the devices so that they are not really worried if that those devices they come with the proper security or if they are uh properly secured in terms of the architecture in which they are involved in uh well we are now uh, technically moving on to our Mentimeter session, which is, uh, well, a space for you to participate in our discussion. However, I saw that there are some messages in this chat. So uh, before we move on to the Mentimeter uh, activity, I just wanted to give the floor maybe to two people, one on site and one online. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, either unmute yourself if you're online or just come to the mic, uh, well, two people, so we don't take much time. So if you have any questions, those people that are typing in the chat, feel free to do so. Yeah. Oh, I can just pass the mic. Yeah. I'm a little closer to you. <laughs> So basically, it's on. <laughs> it's on. Are you able to hear me? Uh, so basically, I've followed the discussion. However, there are two terms that are being used interchangeably IoT and AI. The question is when does IoT become AI? Because as you are aware, AI is the, it's the device being able to learn and operate independently decisions based on its uh, data that is being fed. There comes a time when an IoT device at some point learns and understands the situation and its operations to an extent whereby it now operates autonomously. That now becomes AI. So my question is when I've partially answered it, I know, but I want in an answer from uh, the panels, when does IoT becomes AI? Because to, to discuss IoT in a silos, you, whether you like it or not, you're going to bring AI. When you discuss AI, whether you like it or not, you have to bring IoT. So in, in these two terms, when does IoT, IoT graduates into AI? Thank you. I think I'll give the floor to whoever wants to start. Yes. <clears throat> well, uh, when we prepare this session, we we don't think in the idea of mixing the, the AI and the IoT like like the artificial intelligence inside the sensor, right? We we just say like uh, on one side we saw the IoT security. On the other side, we saw the artificial intelligence misuse that maybe that word, uh, we, we have received some criticism about that. But the idea behind is that uh, we know that there are like bias things or safety things in, in the artificial intelligence that need to be solved or at least to be achieved. So, but, but yes, I, I think that it could be a combination of, of IoT and artificial intelligence in some manner. I don't really know that, uh, that really think that that maybe the intelligence of, of the, the artificial intelligence or the decisions will be like inside the sensor because of the capacity and the constraint nodes. But maybe at some kind of time, all these sensors data came to, to a gateway and this, this process that will uh, operate or, or process all this data could, could take some decisions based on, on artificial intelligence. So just to, to clarify that, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you want to ask. No, not really an answer, but just to reply to his question as well. I think they exist interchangeably because they can be, that's why they are termed as emerging technologies. But what's really interesting, perhaps, is what really distinguishes this too is that, you know, AI, I mean, IoT deals with, you know, how devices interact with the internet, whereas, you know, AI, is about the data being fed in these devices to operate. I'm not sure if that really explains it. He wants to take it. I think Ahita also wanted to comment on that. Yes, thanks, Juliana. Yeah, so I just wanted to say 
say that uh, you can link up uh, IoT and AI according to my perspective. So what I think is, uh, for example, if you have sensors put on your body measuring your um, blood pressure or your uh, blood pumping rate or you know various sensors looking at different parts of your um, different uh, functionalities of your body, then all this data uh, goes to um, let us say a cloud or, or a platform or a server where all this data will be processed either in real time, let's say, and then insights are made out of these. So when the insights part, the prediction part, the analysis part, and eventually actuation part is where machine learning comes into play. And if we were to link, like I think, like Nicholas was talking about how um, you know artificial intelligence could run on the uh, devices itself, you know, calling it a smart device. In IoT, the, there is a lot of resource constraints, um, like I mentioned, battery in terms of power consumption, in terms of storage overhead. So it makes it difficult, but if you were looking at any other smart device which allows for a lot of computation, then you can run machine learning and artificial intelligence or algorithms on it to do the processing and also the device, uh, the smart device itself does the actuation. So the instructions that you give it um, based on the data it senses, it performs right there, then and there. So that's the uh, thing I, that's, that's what I think, you know, is the relation between IoT and AI. And similarly in terms of security, if I were to give any inputs, uh, if your data that is being uh, sensed by your uh, sensors of the IoT device get corrupted, your database, uh, data sets that you're using to train your machine learning models with will, will get corrupted, eventually affecting the predictions or insights that you're bringing out of the um, um, models. Thank you, and then Savio. Uh, thank you again by, by the, for the question. Uh, I, I completely agree with you. Uh, there is a big uh, interception between the, the two areas. And by the way, uh, the machine learning reinforces IoT in the point of view of usability. So if you have to go and uh, operate manually one one in, in, uh, Internet of Things devices. It will lost a, a lot of of, pot of potential uh, for making life easier. Uh, but uh, in the current moment, uh, we still have uh, as the other panelists uh, so much uh, resource constraint, and we have just a few applications uh, like uh, if this then that services or 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 uh, any simple configurations uh, linking uh, sensors and, and actuators for the home IoT or, or even for wearable devices like smartwatches and so on. Uh, this needs to be a concern. And this also goes in, into my point of local operation uh, because this gives more reliability and uh, Remove the inferences uh, from the manufacturers. It, it keeps your the inferences about your life in your uh, local network with you. You can decide to put it to the cloud, but uh, it's you can opt for it. it, it this is not uh, uh, it, it should be your option, not not from the manufacturer, from the on the current uh, IoT model. Uh, but yeah, I think that in a few years when we have more uh, comp computer power in the, the home IoT devices, uh, we have uh, we need to be prepared for, for the con this concern uh, and make also the device more secure for uh, anyone who uh, try to, to uh, get uh, an unauthorized access to that device. Uh, just can't. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm just gonna allow one more question from, uh, let me see here in the list, uh, Fred. Uh, you can unmute yourself and ask your question and I'll just ask uh, please to make it brief so we can move on to the Mentimeter. Fred, are you there? All right, so I guess Fred, oh yeah, I see. Can you there. hear me? Yeah, yes, please go ahead. You. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity. So mine wouldn't be a question, but uh, uh, a little follow-up answer to 
what Ihita gave. I think Ihita explained it uh, very clearly. So when you take the AI and the IoT in itself, it can actually stand separately in silos. There are, there are instances where you will be able to bring them together because when you take IoT in itself, we are talking about the embedded devices. So those embedded devices can be, uh, can be programmed to perform just one tax. And the, I, the AI in itself, it's also like a software, an algorithm that you do, you program. And that algorithm kind of analyzes some data, the, the test data that you are giving to it. And then once it does that, uh, you do the test and then you pass all the tests that you've, you've assigned it and you think your model is ready, then you can deploy that model onto a machine to, uh, to, to do the analysis for you anytime that there is similar data coming to it. When you take the two instances and you are looking at IoT being skilled to be able to perform that uh, same action on a very large scale, then you can apply AI to the IoT. And at that point, you get the IoT device to be able to uh, perform a lot of analytics on the data that you are receiving from the AI, uh, the embedded system or the IoT system. And that is where the AI comes into play. Then when you are looking at the security, I think the last speaker mentioned something uh, that is, he was talking about edge computing where your data is resident on the, uh, the local device that you are using, but you choose to sync it to the cloud. So it is also very important that that aspect is given to the users to decide whether they want to sync their data to the cloud or they do not want to sync it to the cloud. And that would be looking at the, the data privacy and security. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment, Fred. Uh, since it was a comment, uh, I'll just move on to the Mentimeter in the interest of time, but thank you very much for your considerations. I think they're very relevant to our discussion and have a lot to do with what we are talking about on the relationship between AI and privacy and security. Uh, so I'll send, I've sent uh, the link for the first Mentimeter activity on Zoom. We can also see, for those who are on site, uh, there's a code and the screen, you can see it there. Uh, so you can go to uh, www.menti.com and then just type in the code and you're gonna access the same screen we are seeing here. Uh, so the first question that we have here uh, is uh, what are the best approaches to establish processes for meaningful public participation in the development of uh, national AI policies in Africa? Uh, if you want to give us a little bit more of uh, context on what the question means and what uh, you're expecting as a participation from the audience. Yeah, I mean, uh, when you look at, you know, the, the current uh, global discourses on AI ethics and AI development across uh, the globe, uh, you know, they are mainly driven by multinational uh, corporations and you know researchers and activists from mainly global south countries and we are saying that has to change we need to see a global balance where all uh, you know stakeholders are involved in 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 these global development processes but more especially i think in relation to to this topic we have been really you know seeing a lack in um, you know, AI national policies in Africa, and we really don't know what could be the, the gaps there. And we're trying to understand, uh, you know, meaningful ways that we could promote public participation, particularly for all stakeholders in this process. Thank you very much for the context. Uh, we have now a voting situation in which uh, we have seven points for develop a common ethical and AI and human-centered basis for AI. And the second place is goes to prioritize and support research in AI. Uh, in order for us to continue the debate on this, I'm, I'm just gonna invite anyone who has voted in this uh, Mentimeter and wants to share 
with your perspective to come to the floor, either by raising your hand on the chat or by just uh, stepping to the microphone down here. So if you want to participate on this discussion on the approaches to establish processes for meaning, meaningful public participation on AI in Africa, just feel free to either comment, uh, either raise your hand or come here to the floor. I'm going to allow like one person or maybe two, depending on the time. So I see that Nancy has her hands raised um, on Zoom. So Nancy, if you want to unmute yourself and yeah, give it the floor. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity and greetings from Kenya. My question is, how are we factoring in the aspect of inclusion? What are we doing for youth with disabilities when we are talking about these emerging technologies? Are we including them in our working groups? And how can we make these technologies accessible to them? Thank you. Yeah, uh, good question. I think your question has a lot to do uh, with the development of human-centered AI, which is also one of the topics that uh, we are discussing here and the establishment of processes for meaningful public participation. Uh, so if anyone wants to comment on that, uh, feel free to do so. You're good, okay. All right. Yeah, I mean, Nancy's question is really timely and important. And I think this is one of the key issues that we often really don't think about in terms of you know policy development particularly when we talk about how emerging technologies affect the society so i think it's really high time that you know policymakers start thinking about how we can develop inclusive policies to also cater for people with disability um, or you know issues around accessibility there so in terms of what is really happening, I'm not really quite in touch with any other policies that are speaking to issues around disability from where I come from, but I'm really you know, happy to hear from what other participants think here. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so I sent uh, the link for the second Mentimeter. Uh, we have also the same thing. Uh, so there's a link on the chat and there's also the code here so you can access it through the platform and just typing in the code. So uh, Nicole, if you want to introduce the question. Yes, <clears throat> because uh, maybe you cannot see at the screen because it's really uh, uh, small, but which of the following scenarios do you think infers a higher risk at the level of AI biased for the future and why? So here we have four different options, like multiple choice. The, one, the first one, the A, is skin color is biased in face facial recognition. That is one of the things I mentioned in, in, my, in my talk at the beginning. So if you think that infers a higher risk, please mark on the Mentimeter. The second one, B, is AI is likely to show language bias and reinforce the existing prejudices. That is uh, where what I talked about, um, some chatbots recognizing women and men differently because uh, different context so that is underrepresented so maybe that is a, a risk uh, so option c is over representation of certain factors in the training data sets this means to there are factors that are over represented so maybe are minorities that are not taken in account and d that is the last option is extrapolate what is true of individuals to entire group like for example people with disabilities are a small group so maybe the from the from one region or 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 the algorithm could identify some patterns from this group and assume that all the individuals of the group have the same characteristics and then uh, have some errors right and then this algorithm so we'll see for now we have d and c so the most important are the over representation or the extrapolation to individuals uh, from the entire group two c's and someone put a comment there, all of them and the ramifications are extremely dangerous. It's like comparing for poison and which is a killer. <laughs> and another one put C and D. So it seems that C and D, this underrepresentation or overrepresentation of the data is the most uh, 
risky things for the audience, uh, these sorts of other problems. Okay, maybe we could uh, or have comments or go continue to the next one. So just a disclaimer, there's no right or wrong answer, right? The idea is for us to, to discuss this thing. So uh, who made the comment? All of them and their ramifications are extremely dangerous, like comparing for poisons. Uh, if that person wants to speak up, I would love to hear what you have to say about the topic. <laughs> Guess is somebody very shy. Uh, uh, hi, actually, I wrote that. Um, yeah, go ahead. So I, I, I think it's like, um, yeah, as I wrote it, as, as simple as a poem, you know, uh, because like where you come from and uh, um, uh, the reason or like what you represent, uh, the minority, the majority, you know, like, um, so like, uh, it's, um, it's like that, it's, um, uh, uh, everything related is dangerous, I think, you know, like uh, you cannot just focus on one or A or B or C or D. So, yeah, that's the point. Uh, okay. Uh, if yes, if we don't have more questions, we could continue with the next one. Oh, you got a question. Yeah. If you have a question, just feel free to go around the mic and, and ask me. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, in relation to what uh, Nico mentioned about privacy and the discrimination, the artificial intelligence can sometimes be with aspects such as facial recognition. How can we ensure that the technology and tools uh, used to collect data are adequate to uh, un um, rigorously identify the user in order to promote uh, or respect and protect uh, human rights? Well, there are some, uh, for example, uh, practices that could ensure that this algorithm could include all the voices or all the, the representations of the populations. So these techniques are like adding more uh, overrepresented data of the of minor, minority groups. That could be a solution. So if you have, for example, I don't know, uh, someone with uh, violet hair that maybe is not so common uh, globally, uh, then you need to add uh, more data if you are talking about an image recognition system or if you're talking about i don't know a, a density of the hair in, in your head so you need to 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 multiply the quantity of data for from the minority groups i think and with the over representation data is the same so you need to 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 remove some some kind of this uh, data from the majority groups so to to have more space for these smaller groups that are some techniques that are used nowadays and, and there are some standardization processes happening that aims to 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 do this like, like a general thing because if not we will end with millions of different algorithms that are really biased thank you for the question oh you've got a question yeah feel free to come Hi all, it's great to be here. Um, I'm David from United Nations Climate Change. And I actually am listening to this um, with uh, great interest because a lot, of the, uh, the, a lot of the solutions can be applied to or AI. Um, algorithms can be a part of the solution to adapt to climate change or to mitigate climate change. The question is now, we are in the Internet Governance Policy Forum. Is there, from the governance perspective, I, I see a little bit, we have a, probable future like if we just let corporations walk away with it and you know like use don't have any privacy but what would be the desirable future and how do we get there what what are governance policy measures that could be play, put into place today on an international but also on a national level to bring us to a desirable future yeah great question uh... yeah I, I mean a possible scenario in this question that really comes to my mind is, uh, you know, from the positive side of it would be, you know, a situation where uh, we are able to use AI to assess and predict, um, you know, the risks and uh, damages related to climate change uh, in that case by application of algorithms, uh, which would then allow us to, you know, uh, assess 
the the impact in the in the environment that's just the closest i can i can really think about that i'm not quite really you know much knowledgeable in that area but i'd really you know like to pass it on to other colleagues here I mean, just stepping out of my role as moderator here, uh, I really liked your question because uh, I think when we look at technology such as AI and IoT, we always have to have in mind that this is human shaped, right? Technology does not develop by its own, it does not go on a, on a path in which we cannot interfere. So in the same way that uh, we sort of created this, we can also uh, use it for our own good. So it is, uh, we cannot look at AI and IoT from like a deterministic perspective and just say, okay, we cannot control that. So let's try to, I don't know, uh, deal with the fact that this technology is just taking our data and maybe using it uh, for purposes that are not in our benefit. So uh, I think the the fact that we're here in this forum already means that we, that we acknowledge that, that we don't think uh, this is the way forward. And uh, I think an important thing that we can do in order to to really use that for for good purposes, especially when talking about the environmental cause, is just be aware that uh, there might be biases, but uh, you can try to think about good practice to to mitigate them and and engage in this po policy discussions and also in good corporate practices that exist and they're being developed uh, year uh, year by year because there are discussions happening and yeah. We we can we can shape it in in the way that we want if we want to, yeah. So if you want to add to that, yeah. Uh, all right. So moving on to the third Mentimeter. Uh, thank you, Nico. I already said the link. Uh, yeah. So Nico, if you want to introduce the question. Well, now again with artificial intelligence. What do you think is the best way to reduce this bias thing in machine learning algorithms and why? And the options are A, design AI models with inclusion in mind, B, perform targeted testing. This is uh, test exactly these minority groups that you want to be included. And C is improve AI explainability. This is the way, uh, how, what the algorithm has decided and why, right? So if you improve explainability, you could, um, uh, it's, it's like the, the other two points. So you can have a sense of reduction in, in the bias. All right, thank you, Nico. So we have already some comments here. So uh, whoever wrote uh, comments, if you want to uh, share. <laughs> I don't know who's snoring, but uh, <laughs> hope it's not my mic. <laughs> well, someone uh, write a multifaceted strategy needs to implement it that would address all of the three, A, B, C. <laughs> so okay, people are- Aaron has his hands um, raised. So Aaron, I'll give you the floor. Uh, yes, um, I hope you all can hear me. Yeah, we can. Okay, I was the one who wrote that uh, multifaceted strategy. Um, and, and the reason why I thought of that is I was reading the options and uh, in reading them, I was reminded of something I had read from the uh, philosopher of ethics of artificial intelligence, uh, Nick Bostrom. And one of the things he mentioned is that um, if we're to have AI being used, for example, in the public space, um, in, in roles that would, in the past, let's say 50 years ago or so, would have been filled by humans, then one of the requirements, uh, the acceptable requirements, is that the, the, the system would have to uh, satisfy the, the social requirements of that usage in the public space. And, um, but a lot of these social um, situations and problems are, are, are very complex. And out of the three options that were mentioned there, given all of that, I would think that we would actually need to use all three of those at the very least in order to try to get at some of the problems that we've been having um, leading to you know, violation of human rights, discrimination and so forth. And that, that's why I wrote a multifaceted strategy. Thanks, Aaron. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> 
I don't know if you have anyone else here. Yeah, I, I'll just send a link for the fourth one. Oh, okay, yeah. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Zana from Brazil. I'm a law student and I was the one who picked ABC as well. Um, I was wondering specifically about um, AI in the judicial making process. Um, well, where I come from, we do not use it for decision making, but I've been reading about um, some um, countries that do use it and as the US and they have really big problems um, with point number C um, because sometimes um, states, they have the right to hire private companies that don't um, release how this um, analysis is being made, this analysis of data. And I was wondering if you guys have any input and how can we um, use AI in the decision-making process if it is possible to do it in a non-biased way um, or the very least, um, if it is possible to do it um, just for assessing a judge uh, in a way that is not uh, a threat um, for the victims uh, or the people being accused of crimes. Uh, so yeah, that's my question and thank you, <laughs> excuse me. Thank you for the question. Nico? Yes, I could answer. Well, I think there are two separate things because decision-making processes are when the state wants to, to take some decisions for the future of the country or they need to, to realize how to proceed on something, this one thing. But for example, in a charge, when you have a, a charge there and, and you need to take a decision uh, with all the information, maybe you have um, a crime or something and you have uh, the algorithm has photos, has a log, has the, the chats, and with all the information they need to dec decide. So this bias thing will appear in, in all the, of these uh, things I mentioned. And so at the end, it's, it's a complex thing. I, I don't really hear uh, of any uh, shots uh, uh, or processes in, in the law uh, using these, these algorithms now, but for sure it's something that we need to, to, to take in mind and, and explore to, to see how, how to, with these multidimensional things, uh, we could de deal with the, with the bias thing. Yeah, I mean, in addition to what you're saying as well, uh, isn't it interesting that oftentimes when we talk about uh, biased and discriminatory AI technologies, we often react after the incident has happened? Yeah? How about we then start addressing the issues at a product development level where technology companies train their product and software developers about the importance of embedding ethical uh, policies or practices in their product development so that it saves us the time of having to be fighting this litigations in court. To me, it really doesn't make sense at all. And I think it speaks to the ignorance that big technology companies often uh, lack this oversight in their product development. And I think it's our you know, our role as civil society to start speaking out about these issues. And uh, that's just what I think. Right. So I'm think uh, hi, hello, I'm from Poland and I'm a physics student. Uh, and as I understand, uh, like always the bias on the uh, artificial intelligence depend on the data, like the data selection. But actually, isn't like we always need some biased let's say but it's us who need to select the right data so for example the data that are represent some uh, human value so we can speak about this uh, human certain uh, artificial intelligence because it us who want this for example program act in the way that it's uh, consistent with, with our values so actually we always need a biased some kind of bias but it's us who need to select this data right <laughs> That's an interesting question, actually. It's, it's the same question you're asking is more or less like you as a white person developing a facial recognition technology that is going to identify me as a black person. And that very same technology fails to identify my black skin. So what I'm trying to say here is, I think 
product developers and people that fit these systems with data need to be cognizant of the inclusive aspect or element of it in how they how they train the algorithm. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just intrude? Sorry. <laughs> I think the point that you brought is really interesting because, uh, well, of course, uh, if you put rubbish in, there's going to be rubbish out. That's that's the principle, right? But also the people who are assessing what's rubbish or not should also be aware of their own biases. So that's why uh, one of the points that is most interesting in this discussion is that uh, we should not only look at the data, but also the people who are assessing that data. So we need to include people who are part of minority groups also in the development process, also in the data analysis process, so that these people who are conscious of the biases that affect them can be able to intervene and, and well, basically get rid of them. Uh, but yeah, very good point. Thank you for bringing that up and I'm passing. <laughs> Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Actually, uh, I, I'm not exactly the AI guy, but okay, come on. Uh, that there is also one fundamental point in, in, in the point of view of AI that is uh, not only in the training of AI, but what features, uh, what aspects of one person of one data you are taking into account. So, for example, when you are trying to recognize one person what should I look for? It's the, the, the way your face, uh, the, the, the color of your skin, your hair, uh, or something else. So we still don't know how to completely analyze uh, a, lot of a lot of things uh, to, to use as a feature for classify, classifying data and having inferences with, with AI algorithms. Uh, and this way, we still have biases in our, our decision of the points, but we, we still don't have uh, a complete understanding of what should we take into account. In On to the next Mentimeter activity. Pass Miko, if you want to. This one is uh, from Savio. Yeah, I mean the screen. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so <laughs> thank you again. Uh, uh, this question is to we build a word cloud, and I will. Uh, uh, I need to th this feedback from from you to understand uh, as uh, uh, a device chair of the dynamic collision in internet standard for security and safety, uh, uh, vice chair of the IoT security by design uh, working group in, the, in that dy dynamic collision. Uh, how can uh, we address the type of uh, uh, operation the problems uh, around the operations of uh, home IoT devices or other type of, uh, top types of devices, wearables or smart cities and so on, but mostly in the home IoT. So how can we handle with the problems uh, with, with this kind of, uh, of things? And what is your main concern uh, regarding this? Uh, go ahead. So, uh, hello, uh, I am a security specialist in IoT. Well, uh, my main concern is about how we can use the same, the same hardware, the same system in multiple services, because usually when you are dealing with this kind of technology, they are uh, company related. So you need to use their systems and their infrastructure. So my main concern is about that, like, oh, if I have uh the opportune uh, if i bought this i can i change the system can i use it to my own interest at my own infrastructure not depending on some company or some brand to be able to use this technology to uh, in my house like yeah thanks 
Uh, so you mean something like uh, the freedom to change the firmware of the device, or uh, or even updating my device, the hardware of my of oh, my device? Yeah, actually, not only that. Just if I want to keep the device exactly the same, but instead of sending to the servers, the company server, I can send it to another company or even to myself. So it's that that matters the most to me the possibility of selecting what system you will use to process this data. Ah, thank you. Uh, that's the point. Uh, you have the opportunity to choose to where the data is going. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, just one, one last comment on, on this point. As I mentioned, uh, the DCA triple uh, this is also a, one invite uh, for everyone who is interested in cybersecurity, uh, topics. I, uh, uh, the security by design is only one of the topics. We have also procurement uh, and uh, digital education uh, initiatives for cybersecurity, uh, not only for IoT, but uh, for sure I'm going to take uh, those points like the attack on ours. Uh, maybe uh, th this comment was in the point uh, of view, uh, this uh, attack coming from the, the devices manufacturer uh, and the excess of power also from the manufacturer. I, I think that is, it's it, but uh, I hope we have a point. Thank you. Uh, does anyone want to add to that technical question? Um, well, we have two comments on in the Mentimeter, so I guess uh, if the people that added them want to speak up, feel free to do so. Otherwise, we move on to the next Mentimeter question, which is also from Savio. So if you want to. So uh, back to the point of changing the way we uh, operate uh, the IoT devices in, IO, uh, in our home. Uh, I have suggested some, some options on how to uh, face this issue, like uh, this, uh, other options uh, or keep the thing uh, as it is. Uh, but the main point of this is the configurations. It's like, should we improve the uh, user interface and the user experience while configuring a device? Uh, or outsourcing the, the security deployment uh, for your ISP, for example, uh, educating the end users uh, to do a well configuration or uh, using plug and play uh, protocol as UPnP, uh, um, MDNS, or any other uh, as PCP, or, or, or if uh, we have uh, any other suggestion. So please feel free. We got one comment on educating users. Uh, is the person, okay, more people now. If you want to step up, talk about it, feel free to do so. Uh, this is a forum, so you're very much invited to speak. <laughs> uh, we don't want this to be a lecture, so yeah. All right, uh, so I guess if nobody wants to speak, we can move on to the next one. <laughs> yeah. So I just sent a link to the sixth one, uh, which is from Ahita. So Ahita, if you want to introduce the question, please. Yes, yeah. Um, so um, my question is about you. Know, like I'd mentioned previously, like one of the challenges with securing IoT devices was the fragmented uh, standards that we have currently. So, do you think it is required to have standards for security of IoT? So, this is. I'll just take up two quick questions after which we can have a discussion on the next two three months we have. Great. Thank you. If somebody would like to talk about why standards would be required, um, just to put in a perspective. Yeah, Joel, go ahead. 
Okay, hello again. Uh, I would like to argue that we need standards, including to the last question, because uh, when you have these standards well known in the industry, uh, the user will be able to understand, if they understand the, of the functionality of one system, they will be able to use it in others too. So if you have these fragmented uh, types of connections and systems, OSs, uh, UXs, the user will need to learn everything from the, uh, from the basic again. So if you have uh, standards also during the configuration process, the person would be able to learn uh, how to configure one system to be able to configure others too. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Great. Um, any more comments? Thank you. Yeah, Ahita, if you want to uh, have follow up. Yeah, I would just like that. to add to that. Yeah, I'd just like to add to that. I think those points, that's exactly what uh, we're looking at, you know, standards for security of IoT. And I think previously in the panel discussion, we mentioned uh, digital skill sets and digital literacy. So bringing in standards will, you know, these norms will make sure that even if you're not very well skilled with your devices, the devices still have baseline minimum security requirements so that it doesn't um, compromise or uh, affect the functionality of the device or something that people might not be uh, aware of. So I think standards, that's one main thing, just like um, my friend just mentioned. So yes, um, if there are no more comments, can we move to the second question since I think we're running out of time? Yeah, we actually have one more question by Sarah. Uh, Sarah, I'll oh, give you the floor, but please, uh, if you can be very quick because we need to wrap up. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to add that we need to have standards because if we don't, then we leave the uh, security aspect to the developer or whoever is building a product and that's not safe, which means we'll find ourselves again in a place where we are complaining that uh, some of these things have not been catered for. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I completely agree. <laughs> Stepping out of my position as moderator again. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, uh, we need to wrap up, uh, so I'll give, uh, well, 40 seconds for each one of you to, uh, for final remarks, and well, thank you already in advance for attending the session. <laughs> Nico, please stop sharing your screen. <laughs> well, I, um, I could Julian, say some... if I could just um, interview. Oh, okay. Please, please, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, oh, go ahead, so Anita. this was just regarding the, um, the second question. I think we've answered the second question since we were talking about pros and cons. Um, so, uh, yeah. Nicholas, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. I just want to say that um, this is very interesting because the in our session, we touched on artificial intelligence at the same time as IoT. I really want that you don't be like overwhelmed because of that. But our main idea was that like to discuss these emerging technologies with and from the youth perspectives, right? Uh, and yes, uh, I, I think that we need to go uh, for the AI, we need to go to the global standards, global standards, and people is that uh, is the one that create these standards. So that for the AI and for the IoT, I think we have several examples of uh, different protocols that are being made from different standardization bodies like the IETF and the HPPE. For example, for the problem that you say, Joao, there are some uh, protocols like the software update on the Internet of Things that, and the trusted execution environment protocols that are more with the manufacturer. So it, how to maintain this uh, execution environment secure? So when the, for example, when the sensor uh, head uh, starts, the, if there is not updated with the, with the last uh, uh, security things from the manufacturer, then the only thing that the, this device can do is to update themselves. So just responding that there exists some kind of uh, protocols that are, that are uh, being developed uh, for these concerns. Thank you. 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 Th
you know, and in closing, I'll just say, you know, we can talk about the stability and security of um, uh, emerging technologies without talking about policymakers and also the inclusion of other, you know, different stakeholders, because that actually brings, you know, the element of inclusivity in policymaking processes. And I think I'll just emphasize that. Thank you. Yeah, I take you go first. Hi. Um, so as my closing remarks, uh, I would like to say that, you know, since we are all sitting at the Internet Governance Forum, which is a multi-stakeholder platform, all of us, um, and this session specifically, we're encouraging the young people to contribute to, um, you know, the domains of uh, artificial intelligence and IoT. So when we're talking about standards, I would personally also, and I'm sure the panelists would agree that we want to encourage the young people as one of the key stakeholders to contribute to standardization mechanisms around the security of IoT and especially and also artificial intelligence. And um, it's important that, um, you know, you uh, there are lots of these organizations, for example, the ones with the European Union, the one, you know, in India also we have a few, then we have NIST in the United States, and all of these organizations do open up for inputs. So uh, from various stakeholders, so please make sure that, you know, you are contributing to this process to eventually create very robust and inclusive and uh, great standards for um, the emerging technologies. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, I will be really fast because we are up <laughs> on time. So uh, about this topic on, on uh, standardization, please join uh, join a session as I'm uh, that I'm speaker tomorrow. I'm gonna talk about one uh, security protocol that I'm proposing in the ITF for security management uh, management of. Uh, uh, IoT in, in home networks, uh, about the AI and the IoT. I think that we really, really need to keep talking about that and the intersection and in the join of the, this topic too. So uh, that's it. <laughs> thank you very much for the closing remarks. And also thank you for attending and actively participating in our session. Yeah, uh, have a great evening. Yeah. <laughs>